When it comes to landscape astrophotography, we're always striving for the highest possible image quality. Now, it's funny, you know, when we begin our nightscape photography journey, we're just happy to get a shot in focus. But as we progress and get past the basics, it's, it's not uncommon for most people to look for that little bit better image quality from our photos. Nightscape photography throws heaps of challenges at us. And having done a fair bit of different types of photography myself, I can tell you that this form of photography is actually the most challenging and demanding of them all. So why is that? Well, I think the, the simple answer to that question is that it's quite technically demanding. You need better understanding of photography principles. You need better cameras, faster lenses, oh, oh, and, and then you need to deal with operating in complete darkness and often in freezing temperatures. We also have to battle our own feelings of uh, inadequacy and self-doubt. So there's a lot going on, even to capture a basic shot. And that's why it's so important to get the basics right before we even try to move on to more advanced methods and ideas. Now, before I elaborate a bit more on these things, I wanna draw your attention to the one thing that is central to causing us lots of grief when out trying to shoot the night sky and landscape. It's the simple fact that due to the rotation of the Earth, the stars appear to be moving across the sky. Look, it's a subtle movement, but it's real. And you all know that if you set your shutter speed too long, you'll soon find out exactly what I'm actually talking about. The stars won't be pin sharp. They won't be pinpoints of light. They'll be these, uh, I guess, elongated streaks. So keep in mind, that to shoot the stars from a fixed tripod, we need to limit our shutter speed. Now, I often chat with photographers who are experienced landscape shooters, and they sometimes struggle at first with nightscape shooting because of the, uh, I guess, the radically different camera settings required. Look, many of these guys have never shot above about ISO 800 or so in their lives. You see, in general, photography we set our aperture and our shutter speed for the desired outcome. And then last of all, we set the ISO. And for most normal photography in daylight, this will be at base ISO levels. In fact, I would probably suggest that most people have their ISO set to about 100 and never touch it. So what does any of this have to do with our topic of discussion today? What I want to talk about is whether we should be using a star tracker to get the best image quality for our nightscapes or use more perhaps simplified uh, capture techniques such as just shooting single images or maybe multiple images for stacking. This is far from a simple yes or no response. And I say that because there are so many elements that go into achieving a great photograph. I guess it'd be remiss of me to, to simply gloss over some of these things in pursuit of a technically perfect image. In fact, I could ask the question, is there any such thing as a perfect image? I guess for me, a better question is, what is it that we want our image to convey? Or, or how does it speak to the viewer? And perhaps how does that image impact me as an artistic creative. Dare I say it, does my photography make me feel better about myself as a person? <laughs> okay, so I can hear your brains churning away now, thinking, what's wrong with this guy? Has he lost the plot or something? Well, you know, maybe I have, but I can tell you that I've pondered these questions many times during my photography journey. And each time I do ponder these things, it brings change to my style or technique that eventually improves my work. And in doing so, it makes me feel better about myself. Now, I've released quite a few videos describing the various methods and techniques I use to shoot my nightscape images. And if you've been following me for a little while, you'd realize that the, 
the vast majority of my photographs are created using a quite creative and, and I guess, dare I say, uh, articulate step-by-step -step procedures. But I'm very well aware that many of you are quite happy with single shot images of the scene that's laid out before you. And look, I do that as well. And I can see that by doing that, we're actually maximizing the experience of being out there under the stars. And the simplistic, I guess, uh, it's, it's a satisfying marvel of, of what we can actually see and what we can achieve without too much fuss. And that's often the outcome of such photo shoots. So I wanna make this point. As soon as we add more equipment and technical steps into our nightscape shooting, we run the real risk, I guess, of diminishing the very heart of the experience of simply being out there under the stars, enjoying the view. All right, so why are so many people getting into star trackers and will it improve my nightscape photography? Now, look, as I mentioned before, when shooting the stars, we're, we're somewhat, I guess we're, look, we're limited in our ability to get the results we want because of the maximum shutter speed limits. Look, because of the shutter speed limitation, we have to bump up the ISO to, to really high levels and buy ridiculously expensive wide aperture lenses to achieve an acceptable exposure. And as well as that, we tend to have to buy the latest and best camera bodies to handle the extreme ISO and low light levels. In its simplest form, a star tracker alleviates all of those things. Why? Because our shutter speed is no longer a limitation. As we lengthen the shutter speed, we can reduce the ISO and even shoot slower aperture lenses. Oh, look, I've seen heaps of people using cheap cameras with kit lenses achieving amazing results. So that makes a tracker a very attractive piece of kit. You know, maybe it does, but not necessarily. Some people actually thrive on technical equipment and machinery. In fact, the more the merrier. While others will struggle with finding the on switch of, of contraptions like that. Now, don't laugh. We've probably all been there at some stage in our photography journey. Now, you see, what I'm saying is this. Yes, you can achieve some wonderful, sharp, detailed images of the night sky by using a star tracker. The tracker simply follows the apparent movement of the stars across the sky. So all we need to do is attach our camera to the tracker, point it to the region of the sky that we want to shoot, and Bob's your uncle. It's a piece of cake, really. Oh, hang on. For this machine to accurately track the stars, we need to make sure we have pretty good polar alignment. Well, what's polar alignment? Well, all of the stars rotate around a portion of the sky called the celestial pole. You can see this illustrated quite well here in the planetarium software Stellarium. Now, depending on the latitude of your shooting location, you have to point the tracker to the celestial pole to align it. So, for example, where I live here is about 37 degrees southern hemisphere latitude. So that means that if I point due south and 37 degrees up in the sky, I'll see the south celestial pole. Well, I can tell you, if you live here in the southern hemisphere and you do that, you'll quickly realize that there isn't actually anything much in that region of the sky at all. So finding that spot to align to is a challenge in itself. It's a lot easier in the northern hemisphere, however. You've got the pole star. Anyway, I think you're getting the picture of what I'm trying to say here. If you use a star tracker that isn't polar aligned correctly, you'll end up with streaks. And that's right back where we started. So I think it's important to correctly align the tracker. But not only that, you also have to correctly balance the tracker, especially if you're using heavy lenses. 
Uh, I guess the other thing that goes hand in hand with, with good balance is a really solid tripod because all of that weight has to be well supported and distributed. Now you'll notice that lots of people attach a counterweight to their trackers to get the balance evenly distributed. I actually do this all the time, even with wide angle lenses, because I find the whole thing operates very smoothly with that particular setup. However, that is a lot more weight to carry around. So apart from getting accurate polar alignment and achieving good balance, you also have to be wary of shooting in windy conditions as that can severely impact the whole thing. Now, with that in mind, I think the larger trackers are better for, for the harsh conditions because they're bigger, heavier, and just more stable. But who wants to carry all that heavy gear around all night? You might also need good batteries and perhaps even a power bank to keep these things running, especially when it gets cold. So the weight just keeps adding up. Now, I really do chuckle to myself when I read the advertisements of all these trackers. They never mention all the added issues involved, only the benefits. So what are the benefits? Well, there's really only one benefit, but it's a big one. Once you sort out the alignment and the balance issues, you can set the camera to shoot much longer shutter speeds and potentially capture the most beautiful night sky images imaginable. So if your aim is to shoot the night sky and you want the highest possible detail and sharper stars, then it's a no brainer. A star tracker will deliver that, no doubt about it. Okay, fantastic. Now, all I wanna do now is incorporate my light painted foregrounds and I'll be set. Oh, but hang on, they don't do that. When you shoot with a star tracker, the stars are nice and sharp and pinpoint but the foreground becomes blurry due to the whole camera mount moving. So what you need to do is turn the star tracker off and shoot your foreground images with a static tripod, the same as you do for a, for a single shot. Then all you do is blend the foreground into the background sky and everything is good to go. It's really quite simple. <laughs> Well, I must admit, I still have a good laugh every time I hear people say that. Blending foregrounds and backgrounds together to look like they are the exact same shot has to be one of the most difficult and time-consuming parts of nightscape photography. So once again, if you want a simple and easy method of shooting nightscapes and don't want to spend hours in the editing suite, then forget about shooting and blending using a tracker. On the other hand, if you love editing images and embrace the, the technical and logistic challenges involved, then you're the perfect candidate for a Star Tracker workflow. Now, even though I owned a Star Tracker, look, many, many years ago, it always sat on the shelf at home when I went out to shoot. For all the reasons I've outlined here, I, I just found all the hassles were just too many to be bothered. And added to that, I had uh, battery and power issues with that one. It was just too much trouble. You know, it wasn't until fairly recently that I've taken up using the Star Tracker again, partly because a representative from Skywatcher here in Australia offered to replace my faulty tracker, which I really did appreciate. And partly because I purchased another brand, the iOptron Sky Guider Pro with the built-in polar camera. This iPolar camera makes the polar alignment a much easier process and I love using this one. So, so now I can set up and be ready to go in look only about 15 minutes. And the other thing that changed is that last year Photoshop released the sky replacement algorithm into their software. For me and my style of photography which incorporates complicated light painted foregrounds, this was a game changer. It really does work well. So there you have it. I, I haven't gone into detail in this video about the actual methods of shooting or editing using a tracker, but you can see some links in uh, separate videos that I produced in the description where I have actually done that. 
I have added the star tracker into my collection of tools to shoot the night sky, but it's not my only tool. I, to be honest, I still gravitate towards static tripod shooting and, and probably stacking multiple images to get the desired outcome in my nightscape photography. What I typically do uh, when I decide to bring out the tracker is incorporate all of these methods to create the final image. And you'll see that in the videos I've linked below. So the question is, should you buy a star tracker for your photography? Well, look, to be honest, only you can answer that. It's certainly not essential. But on the other hand, if you're a little technically and mechanically minded, you'll love the challenge of getting the sharpest possible images. And you'll also have to brush up on your Photoshop skills. But, but you know, that's probably not a bad thing to do anyway. All right. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you like shooting nightscape images, then I'd welcome you to like and subscribe to my channel. I love talking about this stuff and, and I'm always happy to chat with you guys down below in the comments section. And as always, I hope you have a fantastic week and I'll see you next time.